we are just making a quick reminder that this Friday is a special day for the university because we'll be undertaking an outreach to bring awareness on the issues of drug abuse, drug and substance abuse. And this will be a walk that will be taken beginning from, uh, right from the university to Rafiki and its environs. And it will be happening on Friday at 2 p.m. There are details on the net. Kindly keep uh, uh, um, watching on that. We like to bring awareness to all our students. The School of Law is also running a, a conference, a, um, a, a session tomorrow in the afternoon. Our Professor Olandipo and a few others will be presenting an issue on the African theology and environment. You are welcome to log in and follow or even come in person to the School of Law to partake with us. Please encourage the School of Music as they do two or three pieces before we come to the close. Let's put our hands together and receive them on the stage. God bless you, School of Music. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord again. Uh, my name is Vincent, and this is the university brass band. We are going to perform a fusion of uh, How Great Thou Art and Mkono um, Wabwana by Zablon Singers. We welcome to, to, to this presentation.
check. Please encourage the School of Music once again. You have heard these are newcomers. Let's encourage them. The next group, kindly keep going on the stage. School of Music, don't leave the space alone. Kindly, as others finishing, go to the stage. Praise the Lord. Bonjour. Uh, we are the School of Music and Performing Arts, Kabarak. We are going to do a song by the name uh, Il est où le bonheur? Il est où le bonheur? Uh, an old man was asking himself after having tried everything in his life. He married, he made children, he succeeded in his profession, but still couldn't find joy. Um, and for us, we conclude by saying joy and peace is there only in Jesus Christ. Uh, but before we proceed, we would like to teach you a bit of Kinyarwanda. It's a song with three languages, French, Kinyarwanda, and Kiswahili. We shall sing Amahoro. I have sent it to the projection team. Amahoro, you will repeat after me. Amahoro, Arihano, Muriesu. One more time. Amahoro, Arihano, Muriesu. And here is the school band uh, promotion uh, November, uh, December. God bless you. I would want to invite Saat. Continue. We need another lead mic. Let's let's appreciate Saat as he comes. Pesa na marafiki ni nango jafora ni mefanya mziki na kuchora oh ni lijaribu ni mefanya kazi ni nazopenda vile ni wezavyo kupiga sherehe na kujenga mwili na tumai kufora hi lakini kunazo siku nyingi. Marafiki wana nitoka nyakati hizi za upweke kama eli ya kichakani ni kicheki kume na kushoto ni za tu bado nitayairu wa macho yangu nitazame awe ile ulbone ile u ile u Yesu, 
tuanayo faida gani ya kazi yake yote aifanyayo chini ya jua bila kumcha Mungu vizazi huenda vizazi huja lakini dunia hudumu utufunjishe kutesabu siku zetu kazi kile zote na kweli nuru ni tamu tena ni jambo la kupendeza macho yetu kutazama jua na kuishi miaka mingi utufundishe kuhesabu siku zetu itaya yainua macho yangu nitazame awe Invite us to sing together the Kinyarwanda. I know you'd like to know it. Amahoro, Amahoro, Arihano. Muri, yes, you can sing with us. Amahoro, Arihano. Muri, yes, Amahoro, Arihano. Muri, yes, let's sing again. Amahoro, Ari. One last time, Amahoro. Thank you, thank you. God bless you. Peace is here in Jesus Christ. C'est une bouchille bonheur. Rie pas trop fort d'ailleurs, tu risques de l'éteindre. On le veut le bonheur, oui. On le veut. Tout le monde veut l'atteindre. Mais il est en Christ les rois. Les rois des rois jusqu'à l'éternité. Nigeria. Wa, wa. Do you remember? Now we are in Rwanda. Soon we will be where? Burundi. 
We are so grateful. Please appreciate the School of Music. We will take one more piece. The other pieces will wait for next week. This is the last piece we take, and then I pray for the speaker of the day. Time is not on our side, Mr. Wanderi. The next two items will come next week. We have space for you, and God bless you and keep you. This is the last piece, the duet. And then after that, I will come to pray for the speaker. Praise God. Praise God again. My name is Diana Amunya, and I'm going to be singing together with Laura. The song that you're going to be singing today is called When You Believe from the Prince of Egypt. Um, this song is meant to just uh, help us believe through times of trial, through times of tribulations. And when you believe that God is with you, God is always going to be with you. And we hope you'll be blessed. Thank you.
hands together. Let's appreciate our daughters here. Well done. Well done. God bless and they keep you well. Please put your hands together. Let's celebrate them. What a gift. What an ability. <laughs> I now believe Mr. Wanderi told me we give them a whole chapel where they will treat us to a very special music. And we look forward to the January, February, uh, January, April 2024 semester where they will do that. Thank you so much. I'm sure our vice chancellor will say a word on behalf of uh, the management and the university to those presented. I am standing with my brother, Reverend Dr. Elkane Chemboy, whom you know as the HOD Theology Department. Shall we pray as we receive the ministry of the word? Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you so much that we can sit in your presence after taking time off from teaching, lecturing, administering services to people in different offices. Now we can sit before him who is the maker of heaven and earth to be able to be instructed in the way to live our lives. We thank you for men and the women who have stood to serve us this semester and even as we continue to see the close of this semester get near, we thank you for the availability of your ministry. We thank you for the needs of our students and the faculty members, but we also thank you for the needs of the university. Even as we pray for our vice chancellor and his team of management, even as they make hard decisions in hard times, that the Solomonic wisdom will be upon them in the name of Jesus. Even as we thank you for our students as we move into a new month, the second last month of the year 2023, may you supply May you provide, may you protect, may you feed us in accordance to your grace and mercy. Now your servant stands, I pray, that you use him to bring forth that which you have ordained for us. As we thank you for the ministry of the various presentations today, may your name be lifted as we listen to you, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And uh, let's clap for our chaplain also. Right, and uh, thank you so much for those great performances this morning. Uh, glory to God. It's a great honor and privilege to stand before you and God this morning and uh, share from the Holy Scriptures. Um, I've been introduced, and uh, let me go straight uh, into the text for today, which is Acts chapter 14, verse 8. And I'm coming in uh, after several sermons uh, which have looked at the life of Apostle Paul and what a man, uh, what a servant that God used in the first century to bring the gospel to the Gentile world. This morning, I want us to look, morning or afternoon, this midday, I want us to look at this topic of uh, becoming authentic witnesses. When, when God had called Paul uh, along Damascus, he had a mission for him. And by the way, there is never a Damascus without a purpose or a plan. And so God had a plan for him uh, to reach out and to be able to go beyond what other apostles like the lead apostle Peter could do. And is a unique character as, we, as we've seen in the past sermons that God used as his vessel to the nations. So after Paul and Barnabas, Professor Oladipo was looking at the hand, the unforget, unforgettable hand of, of uh, 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 looking at Barnabas and how he became instrumental in introducing Paul to the Christian community. The Bible says that Paul and Barnabas were set, up, set apart and released for the mission work. And they began their mission, mission journeys, confronting the park and strongholds with the gospel, preaching in synagogues, preaching in the streets, and preaching also in theaters. Similarly, believers have been, also, have been called by Christ to be witnesses in different capacities, and as we see in the, in the, in the, in the gospel, gospel according to uh, Mark chapter 3, Jesus called his disciples with two purposes. One was 
he called them so that they can be with him, if you look at verse 12, uh, so that once they are formed within that three, three and a half years, that he will send them to go to the world and, and bring the gospel uh, to the peoples of the world. In Acts chapter, four, chapter 14, sorry, verse 8 to 20, Paul and Barnabas were in Lystra in the, in the first missionary journey. And they performed a miracle in this city, which opened the way for people to listen to the gospel. Uh, mo mostly, you know, they, 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 they would go to synagogues, but it looks like there was no synagogue in the city of Lystra. And so they, God gave them uh, uh, the grace to perform this miracle. And they healed a crippled man, a man who was lame from path. We've seen some, some, some similar uh, miracles in the past also in the book of, in the book of uh, Acts. We are told that this man had faith to be healed. Just like the woman who, who believed that if she touches the hem of the garment of Jesus, that she will be healed. However, this extraordinary event brought confusion, brought several things. One of them is confusion. It brought, brought misunderstanding among, among the crowd. In the spiritual realm, this was a trap. This was a strategy by the devil to tempt these uh, two apostles. It was a strategy to plant pride and to bring destruction along their path. It was a strategy to weaken and destroy their ministry, if that were possible. We are told that the whole crowd uh, went crazy. Uh, in the city of Lystra, when Paul, performed, Paul and uh, Pandapas performed this uh, miracle. And, uh, and uh, they say that the gods have come down in human form. If they were, if they, if they were they had breaking news, they would say, Zeus and Hams are in town today. And they gave Paul and Pandapas some names. Pandapas, they called him Zeus, uh, the Roman god Jupiter. The most powerful of all gods of the ancient world. He was the father of all gods and father of all men. And uh, they called Paul, Hams, uh, equivalent of Mercury in the Roman language. Hams was a messenger. Paul, we see Paul being a spokesperson. Barnabas perhaps was regarded as Zeus because... He was the dignified behind the scenes man. He was, he was the man behind Paul. And, and they gave him uh, the name Zeus. Now, how come they call these people gods? How come they were like gods to these people? There are two things. One is that in the history of the city of Lystra, there was a time they believed that the gods had incarnated. They had come in human form. And no one hosted them in the entire city except one couple. And they were rewarded for hosting uh, uh, these two gods when they visited this city. And those who never, uh, those who never uh, re uh, gave, I mean, received them were, were punished. And so the people interpreted this whole thing within their religious presuppositions. I mean, this happens most of the time. It's like when you set an exam, and there is a concept you explained, you, you think you explained very clearly in class, and then when the student write, a, write exam, they set their own question, and they answer that question. And, 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 and they write even two pages of their own question. And, and you have your own marking scheme. <laughs> so so Paul, Paul, is genuine, Paul and Barnabas are genuinely doing something for God, but the people in their conceptualization of what has already happened is quite different, quite alien uh, to their thinking. The second reason they were compared with gods was because, uh, of course, they, they had ability, ability to perform miracles. We see also the, disciple, the, the apostles, they were distinguished by their boldness, not just, not just miracles, their boldness. They were, they were, yes, they were uneducated people from Galilee, the remotest parts of Israel at that time. But they, they were people who knew what they were talking about. They had seen Jesus, and no one could sway them from that, uh, uh, from, from, from what they had seen or heard uh, from Jesus. And so, 
there are, um, and, and, and so these people spoke with authority, boldness, and, 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 and so they confused them with these gods. How can we be authentic witnesses uh, today? I'll, I'll give some, uh, some few points on, in this regard. First one is remaining true to our God-given identity and mission. If we want to be effective witnesses to various callings God has given us, one of the first things we see here is that we need to remain true to our God-given identity and mission. When the crowd uh, gave Barnabas and Paul these names, it was a prelude to something else. They wanted to worship them. They wanted to offer sacrifices. And so in verse 13, the priest of Zeus, <laughs> this was a high level of spiritual confusion within the Pagan world. Now, the priest of Zeus, in his own spiritual discernment, uh, was able to say these were people from this world. And so he brought in some bulls and, and wanted to offer sacrifices and, with the people to these two apostles. My point here is that we, need, we can remain true to our identity by discerning the counter offers, the, de the devil places on our way, and saying no to those counter offers. When you look at verse 14 and verse 15, Paul and, and Barnabas strongly reacted against this plan. They tore their clothes, and this was a demonstration of, of a deep grief over what the people were doing. How could you do this? How could you even think about this? But this is not something new in God's mission. When you see throughout the Bible, we see God's great servants facing these temptations. If you look at the life of Moses, he was tempted to make compromises when, uh, when, when Pharaoh was negotiating their exit out of Egypt. But Moses remained adamant. Uh, Pharaoh wanted him to worship God, that the Israelites worship God in Egypt. That was the first compromise. And Moses refused. In fact, he said, this, the sacrifices we will worship God with will, will, will bring trouble, will, will, will be disgusting to the, to, to the Egyptians. That it will anger the Egyptians. The second point, when, when Pharaoh realized that Moses was not sitting ground, uh, Pharaoh told him, but just go, but not far away. And Moses said, in fact, we are going to take a three-day three, three day journey. So we're going to step outside Egypt. When Moses refused on that, I'm citing from, this is from Exodus chapter 8, verse 20 to, to, to chapter 10, verse 29. He said, let the men go. Let the rest of the families remain. And Moses refused. The last bargain was, you may all go, but leave your flock and your hearts. And Moses says, not even a hoof will remain. Everything will go. We'll go with our belongings. We will know when we get there what God will want us to sacrifice uh, uh, for him. Moses knew that giving Satan a foothold will soon become a stronghold, and therefore he said no. Early in the ministry of Jesus, there were some counter offers. You remember the fourth day of fasting? And uh, Satan came with a plan to take Jesus through a way that will never lead to a cross, that you will bypass the cross. And there were three temptations we, 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 uh, that are record, recorded in the Bible. If you read uh, Mark, uh, Matthew chapter 4, I'm not going to read, but it was about pleasure, about the lust of the flesh. The second one was about pride of life, egoism. The third one was about materialism, lust of the eyes. And, and telling Jesus, if you, if you worship me, I'll give you all these kingdoms of the world. You're talking about God's kingdom, launching a kingdom of God in this world? I already have it. I can just hand over to you, just do the necessary worship, and I'll give you these kingdoms of the world. The Bible in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 talks about this world. Satan is the god of this world. And Satan here makes an offer and tells Jesus, come on, I can, I can give you what you want. But Jesus knew everything that was happening here. 
he cited scriptures to, to be able to discount uh, these, uh, these views. Apostles faced these temptations. We see uh, Simon the magician trying to offer money so that he can be given the gift of Holy Spirit so that he can be laying hands on people. Also, Paul, you remember when he was uh, in uh, Philippi and there was this slave girl who had the power to tell, about, to tell, thi to, to tell things about the future. And they were, he, the, the little girl was saying, these are the servants of the Most High God. Listen to them. Now, now, I mean, I think if I was Paul there, I would really not have understood there was an evil spirit there. There might have been an evil spirit about the future thing, but then this, there was, she was saying the truth. She continued for some few days, and Paul, <laughs> uh, the apostles, casted out this demon. Was telling people, that these are the servants of the Most High God, and that, you, uh, that, that, that they should be able to listen to them. To remain true to our identity, we should know who we are and who we are not. John the Baptist, when he responded to those who asked him about his identity, uh, uh, said, you yourself can testify that I said, I am not the Christ, but I am sent ahead of him. He also says, he also goes on to say, he must become greater I must become less. That is in John chapter 3 uh, 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 in verse 30. He actually calls himself a voice. That if we are supposed to be true witnesses of Jesus, we've got to figure out where our ego will go. We've got to figure out where, who, who gets glory in what we do. One as if you were. Praise the Lord. John the Baptist regards himself as a voice in the wilderness proclaiming the Lord. That if he's, if he's not visible to anyone, but let it be known that there, is, there was a voice who witnessed to the coming uh, and, and prepared the way for the coming of Jesus. Uh, Peter refused to accept worship from Cornelius. So this was not just Paul's affair, it was also uh, with Peter. Paul and, and Barnabas, in the passage you've read this, morn this morning, uh, told the reply to the crowd, man, why are you doing this? We too are, 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 are humans like you. We are mere human. These, these apostles were, they, they, they were not pretending here. They were not, they were not, they never wanted to assume, assume false identities here. And in many places, Paul introduces himself as a slave of Jesus Christ. That idea was revolutionary in the first century. How do you regard yourself as a slave with no rights? But Paul, that's how he conceptualized himself in God's, in God's agenda of, of uh, proclaiming uh, people to the world. And Pro Professor Oladipo read for us last week uh, Luke chapter 17. Uh, Luke chapter 17, I, 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 um, I think verse 10, verse 10, where it's a, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the disciples are, are told that after you've done all these things, Say we are worthless servants and we have only done what, what has been commanded, what we ought to have done. Paul, uh, Paul was aware of, this, of, this, uh, of, of his identity before Jesus Christ. When he was solving issues in, uh, in the church in Corinth, which were a leadership crisis, and uh, he was, he, he, there, were, there were rangos and people were saying, uh, I'm for Paul, I'm for Cephas, I'm for Apollos, others saying I'm for Christ. And since Paul already formed this identity of who he is before Jesus, before God, I mean, he will tell, he will put off the rest and tell them, I mean, who, who, who is Paul? Who is, Ceph who is Cephas? Who is Apollos? All of us are fellow workers, they are servants in God's vineyard. We water, but God makes it to grow. He was able to solve and, and to, to, to break that impasse because uh, he, he, in his identity, uh, he, had, he had known who he is. People fight, even in workplaces, because they don't know their identity and their mission that God has given them in this world. If you ever discover what God has in store for you and what God has called, for, has called you to do, then you have your own space. You have your own race. You have your own course to run uh, without uh, 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 confusion with others. 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, Paul asks, What do you have that you did not receive? The highest folly of human beings is to pretend to be what they are not. Pretending that they know everything, they are above everyone else, or they are more important than others. We should reject voices that make us look down upon ourselves to the point that we see ourselves as crossovers or unable to do something, accomplish something for God. And likewise, we should be able to reject voices that make us believe that we are giants. Uh, we are super giants. We are superhuman. Our true identity, uh, our true identity estimate should be based on our union with Christ. What Christ says, uh, who, who Christ says we are. And so our first duty is to remind ourselves who we are, and our second duty is to remind others of who they are and that they, 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 need, uh, they need God. We also have negative examples, as I close on this point, we also have negative examples of people who accepted, uh, who, uh, who accepted to be given false identities in their ministries. We know, um, uh, we know Aaron. Uh, when the people approach him to make them gods, Aaron, Aaron said, come on, bring, bring your silver and gold. I'll do it for you. And he assumed a role which it was a false role. Herod Agrippa, when he, uh, in, in, Acts, in Acts chapter 12, verse 22 to 23, accepted the title of God and he died for it. It's only Jesus, when you read in John chapter, chapter 14, when, 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 when Thomas calls him Lord, that he accepts that title, and that's why it's a key scripture on the deity of Jesus Christ, because he accepts that title uh, being Lord. The second point is on how we can remain true, uh, authentic in, uh, become authentic witnesses, is upholding the true gospel. Paul and Barnabas reminded the crowds that they were human vessels, bringing good news uh, to them, the good news of turning from worthless things to, to, uh, uh, and turning to the living God. True gospel entails forsaking vanities, idols, and worthless things. It should lead people from what is unreal to what is real. True gospel leads people from what is idol, what is unreasonable, what is empty, what is deceitful, and what is unprofitable to what is good and genuine. The gospel that does not transform life is another different gospel that is not gospel at all. A gospel that does not ask people to turn from their sinfulness fathers them for the day of slaughter. When the Thessalonians heard the gospel, we read in chapter 1, uh, uh, the Bible says they, they received the gospel not as words of men, but a, a gospel with power. The Bible says they turned from idols to serve the living God, the, the living and true God, and to await uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. That is from verse 9 to verse 11. Their understanding of the gospel evoked faith, hope, and love. Love for God and love for his people. This gospel, it was very important for Paul to have an, a whole understanding of this gospel. And I was asking one of the, I think one of the, uh, our staff in theology, what, what Paul went to do in Arabian Desert for, all, for, for, for many years. And I think he, he, part of it was to conceptualize his understanding of what the gospel is and what it is not. So that when he came out from that retreat uh, period, he was, he was clear in his mind about what is the gospel. Even in the Jerusalem council when they were saying, should Gentiles come, become first Jewish so that they can become Christians? He was very emphatic in his answer that no, uh, once you come to Jesus, that is enough uh, proof of faith. This gospel uh, turned around the life of Paul from the Damascus moment. The true gospel turns people from what, uh, people even who have been written off by society, people who have been considered worthless to become useful people. 
And Paul experienced the power of this gospel in Damascus. And from there, his life turned around. And, and, and when Mutuku was preaching one of the days, and also the prophet was preaching, you know, like, do we really get this Damascus moment, the turnaround moment? And has it happened in our lives? You know, there are, there are times, there are, there are things that make turnaround moments in our lives. Someone can get an accident, and their life's view changes. character development, and I will say that my life changed from that moment <laughs> when I went through that experience. Someone can, 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 be, can, be, can be deceived, and you lose a lot, and your life can change. When Paul conceptualizes the turnaround power in his life, it is not when he knew about Judaism. It is not when he was trained as a Pharisee. It is when he received Jesus. When he encountered, when he was, when, when he, when he was given this true gospel, his life changed. It marked a demarcation of past and, and present uh, in his life. And so if we are supposed to be effective witnesses, then we need to really uphold what is true gospel and, and apply our lives to this message. Number three is understanding who God is. And I, I love that. Paul and Barnabas introduced uh, his polythe polytheistic audience to another God. Uh, uh, in Acts chapter 17, he talks about, let me tell you to an unknown, let me take you to an unknown God and explain to you and give you some information about this God. I was listening in news yesterday, and, um, and one, one of the things that I, I think I liked about uh, uh, Uru Garden's uh, monument is that there is, there, is a, there is a monument to unknown heroes. And, and I felt that that's, that's, that's quite something. I mean, there are people who never made into the history books, but they offered their lives. And that there is a memorial to capture that there are, there are others. There are others we might not have figured them. And Paul goes to this religious city of Athens later and, and, and tells them, you're so religious. And he tells them that they, you even worship a known God. But let me begin here and tell you. When Paul goes to this Gentile world, he is not taking God here, there. He already realizes that God was at work in the lives of people even out there. And he leads people to know this God. And it's very important for us as believers to know the God we serve. Paul said that this God is a living God. Hallelujah. This God is a living God. I'm going to be done in a few minutes. This God is a living God. Where do we get this term for the first time? It is in Matthew chapter 16 where Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say I am? Now, then they go into many answers. Just like if I, I ask people who people say I am, then indirectly people can even say what is in their minds uh, without knowing, and they can be covered under that. But when he asks them, but who do you say I am? And there is, I, I guess, there was silence and Peter, out of a spiritual revelation, says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. We serve a living God. The philosophies of the world today render God as dead. They render God as not there. But God is. The Bible, the Bible refutes that by saying that God is the living God of heaven and earth. The next thing he says is that he's the creator of all things. Right? He's the creator of everything. And in heaven, on earth, in the sea, and everything else in the universe has been created by God. Number three, he is God who is patient with the sinning nations. And the Bible says, in the past, he let people go on their own way. But now, uh, of course, he holds people accountable to their, to, the, to their actions. So that in our, in our own witness, in our own presentation, in our own understanding of people, we know that God is patient. And we can, too, exercise that patience to the people we expect to, uh, that Christ is formed in their lives. 
The next thing uh, he also talks about is that this God has not left himself without testimony. So even in places where Jesus has never been known, that his physical creation is a witness. And we can begin a conversation about God from anywhere, not just the Bible. We can begin a conversation of, about God's existence even from outside the Bible by looking at creation, the hills, the valleys, and wonder, and wonder how great God is. And, 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 and Paul brings this idea, uh, uh, sorry, this idea about, about God is so central in, in the mind of Paul that in our witness, how big is your God? In your, in your belief, in your theology, in your, in, your, in your practice, how big is your God? If God has called you to pick things, to, to, has given you a great vision of something to accomplish for him, and you feel inadequate, the question is, what is your understanding of God? You know, when the Israelites said we, we looked ourselves as, as grasshoppers, when you read their story, there's nowhere referring to God or his word. And, and Paul understood about God's sovereignty and power of all things. The, the last one he said that God sh has showed his, all, his kindness, giving rain and fruitful seasons even to people who do not deserve. Let me tell you, if we gave a human being to manage rain in this world, Ole. Some other people's farms will never, ever, 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 it will be desert, desert, fertile, desert, fertile, uh, 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 patch, patch, like a patchwork all over the world. But God is good God to all people, even people who deny him. Even who say, those who say there is no God, God is still patient and giving them time to come uh, to faith. The last point is, is that for us to be able to become authentic witnesses of Jesus, we need to understand our mission. And, and, and uh, Paul and, and Barnabas were given a mission to the Gentile world. Today, all of us here represent unique purposes God has for this globe. However, Paul was warned of threats, incitement, opposition, and rejection. The absence of challenges in life or in our mission or in God's ministry is not a confirmation of God's will. Let me say that again. The absence of challenges in life and God's ministry is not a confirmation of God's will. Or even turn it the other way. The absence of good times and amahoro moments, the peaceful moments, is not a confirmation of God's will. We still need to discern what is God's purpose. And another last point is never hinge your ministry, your purpose, to reach, uh, uh, that which God has called you on human praises. Jesus never gave himself. If you look at the story of Paul in verse 19 and verse 20 of the passage we read, one minute, the people, one minute, uh, the, the, Paul and Barnabas were a God to be worshipped. Another minute, they were criminals to be slain. It's like, Hosanna, Hosanna, the next thing, the same people are saying, crucify him. And we should never trust uh, uh, praises of men, but have a secure identity in Jesus. So, how will the gospel be heard amidst so many competing voices and worldviews in a pluralistic world? We are called to be true to our identity and mission. We are called to uphold the true gospel. We are called to understand who God is, and we are called to also understand what our mission is in this world. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise your name this morning, this day. We thank you, Lord, because of uh, the believers who have gone ahead of us and the Holy Scriptures that are written for us to be able to learn and be wise unto salvation. We thank you, dear Lord, for the opportunity to see how you bring transformation to lives of people, but that you call us to salvation uh, so that you can use us 
And Lord, you have called us, even in a university setting like this, that it becomes also a formation period and a, a, a formation place where you sharpen our focus, you sharpen our destinies, you sharpen our, our, our understanding of what you've called us to be. Heavenly Father, in the things that you've called us uh, to be, each one of us, we pray that we'll be able to discern your will for our lives. We'll be able to walk in that will and we'll be able to make difference and be able to live uh, and, and become true to our, our, our identity in Jesus Christ. We'll be able to uphold what is true gospel. We'll be able to continue to seek to know you even in our, in our various areas of work and mission. We thank you. Thank you for Kabarak University. And thank you, Lord, for this new month. As we end this new, this new year, we are reminded about God who, who sends his reign to all people and who, 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 who provides fruitful seasons we pray that you flourish our lives, even in this last quarter of this year, that your name will be honored and praised. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Asante sana.